Hello, everybody, and welcome to this second session of our conference. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't already been to one of our sessions, uh, this is just to let you know that the session is being recorded, including the chat, and all sessions will be made available at a later date. Questions for this session um, are going to be taken after each presentation rather than saving them all to the end. If you want to ask a question, there are two ways for you to do this. You can either use the raise hand function in chat or use the Zoom chat. Please do not ask questions via the Hoover chat function. Um, that's it in terms of housekeeping. So I'd like to introduce our first two speakers. They are Professor Catherine Rudy and Dr. Eileen Tisdall. Uh, Kate is curator at the Royal Society of Edinburgh and professor at the School of Art History at the University of St. Andrews. She's the author of six books, recently held a Paul Mellon Senior Fellowship to write a book about physical interactions with the manuscript in late medieval England. And she currently holds the Lever Hume Major Research Grant for a study called Measuring Medieval Users' Responses to Manuscripts, New Technological Approaches. Eileen is lecturer in environmental geography at the University of Stirling. And her research interests include defining climate change through the records of fossil insect remains and sediment stratigraphy to defining human activity and resource management in landscapes through pollen analysis. And it's analyzing pollen in old books that they're going to be talking to us about today. This project has been generously funded by the Leverhulme Trust, for which I'm very grateful. It's part of a larger project called Measuring Medieval Users' Responses to Manuscripts, New Technological Approaches. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Rudy. I'm professor of art history at the University of St. Andrews, and I work on manuscripts and old books. And in particular, I'm interested in developing tools for understanding how people used and interacted with their books, where they took them, what emotions they had around them. And I'm working on a three-year Leverhulme project uh, with my colleague and friend and fantastic pollen specialist, Eileen Tisdall. Do you wanna say a few words about yourself, Eileen? Hi, so uh, my name is Dr. Eileen Tisdall. I'm a lecturer in environmental geography at the University of Stirling. So ultimately, we would like to use the pollen record in manuscripts, that is the pollen trapped in the pages and the gutters and the bindings of medieval manuscripts because it should show us where manuscripts have traveled. So this manuscript, Dean Brown's prayer book, for example, was made in the Southern Netherlands, that, but then brought to Scotland, and it should contain pollen from both places. Now that's ultimately what we're going to work up to at the moment we are still in the, the testing phases to ascertain whether the environment in books is actually salubrious for preserving pollen over a long period of time. So that's what we're setting out to do. So uh, for me, for pollen, it's normally something that's really ancient and I would look in peat bogs, I would look in lakes, I would look in these places that haven't changed much over time and I wouldn't really look at anything this modern so uh, or in a book. So this is completely new and completely different for me but I have to say it's been an amazing journey so far and I've learned so much. Fabulous. So over the course of the lockdown you have built some apparatus in order to uh, begin testing the pollen in manuscripts, which is our joint project, which we're talking about today. Um, can you say a few words about the pollen, Hoover? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, it's an interesting one because uh, we had to kind of think about how would you lift the pollen off the pages of a book without damaging the book and then still being able to kind of capture the pollen. So we borrowed from a lot of the forensic pollen people, um, but their equipment is very expensive. So we had to go for something slightly more creative. And so we just adapted a handheld hoover 
um, with a special filter on the end of it. So the filter is normally used in um, environmental science for filtering water, so testing for bacteria. So I could put in a filter paper that would be small enough to trap the pollen. So that's what we kind of used. And then the next step was to actually use it on some books. But by the time we got to that step, we were most definitely in lockdown. So I had to fall back on books that I had in my own house. I mean, so what was the book you, you hoovered over lockdown? It was a, a, a guide to the Pyrenees. So it's a, a travel book, but it's quite specific because we only used it when we knew we were going on a walk or a, a, a hike. So we would open the page that was relevant to where we were. So that's why we're quite confident it was actually only ever opened when we were out in the Pyrenees, because that's when we used the, 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 the sort of maps and the descriptions of the walks when we were there. So you wouldn't obviously need a guide to the Pyrenees while traipsing around Scotland. So the, no. the pollen that's trapped in that particular book is likely to have been deposited while you were using it. And you yeah. had, it, had it outside, opened it, yes, and then it clapped <clears throat> it shut, trapping inside. But that's fantastic. So could you tell us a bit about what exactly pollen is before we go any further? So all uh, flowering plants produce pollen and it's part of their, their reproductive cycles. Different plants produce different amounts and different types of pollen and at different times of the year. Let's say. So it's all part of the plants flowering and then producing seed. And to do that, they need to produce pollen. Mm -hmm. So pollen in itself is actually really interesting material. It's actually really robust. It is a very tough outer coat. And so it can survive quite long amounts of time in the atmosphere because that's important as pollen. Pollen is either moved through the air or on insects go from plant to plant. Uh, so it's got a very robust sort of outer coat on it, but then that's really useful in terms of because it, then it preserves beautifully. So if you get the right conditions, pollen will preserve for millions of years. So it's quite impressive substance. Um, but mostly most pollen you would look for would be maybe 50 to 60,000 years. It preserves in really sort of uh, wet best in environments where there's no oxygen. So most people, as I say, look in peat bogs or lake sediments for pollen, but it will preserve in really strange environments. So really arid environments are really well known for pollen as well. So as I say, an early interesting kind of substance. And I think we're going to push that very slightly to the limit in this project to work out. So these books aren't, as I say, normal environments where you would hunt for pollen. But um, so far, it's been it's been a real eye opener for me. So how do you know where the pollen comes from when you find a grain of pollen on something or in something or in a bog or in a book or wherever it is? How do you know what the species is and where it might have come from? So this this relies on lots of other people doing a huge amount of work over sort of the centuries that pollen has been used as a, as a, a way in which to work out what environments, what vegetation was growing at a particular time. So lots and lots of research has gone into sort of collecting plants and then looking at the pollen that the different plant species produce and then just basically building up a catalogue of the different plants and keying them out. So uh, uh, roots and botany and, I, and I, identifying plants. So they've set up keys then for pollen. And some pollen types are really, really distinctive. So, um, so tree pollen, for example, is quite different to pollen that maybe has been moved by insects. Could you, could you show the 3D models that you- I can, made? yeah, yes, that. Okay. <laughs> I, I do love these. Um, th and I appreciate that there is a person out there who, who specializes in printing out 3D models of pollen and that yeah. you are the consumer of these. I am, yes, yeah. Some amazing project has, 3D pollen project has been scanning the pollen grains to generate the models then that you can then print in 3D in plastic. So these pollen grains, so this one. That's is fantastic. A, it's a pine pollen. So you can see this pollen grain travels through the air and it's got these two sacks that make it much lighter and so it can travel really long distances so thousands of kilometers pine pollen can travel so pine pollen is actually because it's so big 
um, you quite often can see it. So you, if you go out in your car and you've parked it near some pine trees, then you'll see the pollen on the top of the car. And also you see it in lakes as well. If it's a really good year for pine pollen, it'll be coated on the surface of the lake. So it's quite a visible one. But trees mostly produce lots and lots of pollen and it's quite sometimes either really designed to go through the air or very small to travel through the air. So then flowering plants, which need insects to move their pollen about, um, have slightly different structures. So this pollen here is, looks quite spiky. So it looks like it would be really sticky. So this is like from a group of plants like dandelions. And so here the insects, the pollen sticks together more or sticks to the insect a little bit more. And so then it gets moved from plant to plant. And that's why. Fascinating. Wow. So in the in the travel guide to the Pyrenees, what did you find? What kind of a pollen grain did you find? So we found a pine pollen in the in the travel guide. It was very exciting because you do get pine trees, pine species in 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 the Pyrenees. So one of the tiny drawbacks about pollen is that it sometimes is quite difficult to tell the difference in sort of species between the different pollen types. So some species produce really distinctive pollen types and other species produce a, a pollen type that you can't tell the difference between the different species. So pine is one of those. So you know it's come from a pine tree, but you don't know which species of pine. So, so the pollen grain you found was from a pine tree and yes. that pine tree can be found in the Pyrenees, but it could be found in other places as well. So it's not, yeah. it's it's slightly limiting the geographic area where that tree could have come from, but it's not completely limiting it. No, so this is where you have to put together the kind of the understanding of what you have. So the actual taxonomy the, of the species and then the taphonomy, which is how that pollen rain actually got to be mm -hmm. in your place so I need to think about the book so how does pollen get to a book so that's the difficult bit so normally I don't need to think about that too much because I'm looking in lakes peat box where I can have a pretty, pretty good understanding of how the pollen has landed in that particular place but the book presents a slightly different challenge for me so when we looked at the travel guide that was quite good because I thought okay we had quite a high level confidence that we didn't open that book when we were in Scotland we just opened the book when we were in the Pyrenees. And so I can have a slightly better kind of, you know, say for better sort of certainty that actually I think this pine pollen grain has come from the Pyrenees. We were beginning to answer the question, can books trap pollen, preserve it, and provide clues about where the books were used? With the travel guide to the Pyrenees, we were that much closer to demonstrating that this could be the case. The next step was to try the technique on some older books, ones that were highly likely to contain pollen. They would provide a test environment to answer the next question. Can pollen survive in a book for several hundred years? To tackle that question, we enlisted the help of Bob McLean at the University of Glasgow Library. He suggested a number of books that were likely to contain pollen so that we could begin testing the process on actual special collections items. These books included uh, one titled Flowers Plucked in Those Holy Fields, arranged by the Reverend Arthur Hastings Kelk. And this was produced in Jerusalem by the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews. That's a separate topic altogether. Uh, but the important thing is that the book was made about 1900. And as you can see, it contains actual samples of plant material. And secondly, this book also from about 1900, which is a souvenir volume of flowers and views of the Holy Land, consisting of 12 chromolithographs depicting various places in the Holy Land that has pressed flowers from each of these places mounted onto the facing plate. And you'll see here that there are guard sheets, little tissues between uh, the, the, the pages in order to try to protect and, and consolidate the samples. So this book too should contain pollen from the plants pressed between its folios. 
And the question now was whether that pollen could be extracted safely and whether the book had preserved the pollen grains sufficiently so that they could be identified. To ensure that our practices were safe for the rare books and to help develop the technique, we worked with Kira McKee, book conservator at the University of Glasgow Library. I had a moment um, where I thought, well, maybe we could put a, a protective sort of screen or mesh over the flower samples and vacuum mm -hmm. lightly through that. But I think there's too much risk to the, to the samples from abrasion yeah. and catching them. And if it were to slide or move, I think yeah. it's then quite a catching surface. So I mm. um, moved away from that yeah, uh, idea pretty quickly. Edges. And yeah, then, or in the, like, the middle of the book. There's a yeah in the middle of the book, and I've noticed on a few of the these like tissue guards, like down underneath them, there's quite a lot yes. of dust, and yes. and in some cases little bits of debris from the plant okay. themselves. Yes. And I spoke to Julie about that. Um, that if little, you know, say little bits of these seed heads or plant things have, have kind of come away from the sample anyway and fallen into the gutter, mm -hmm. she's happy to regard that as part of the sample okay. that you collect today. Okay. If little bits of the Perfect. dried thing that have already fallen off. Yeah come yeah, up yeah, in the hoover yeah, then yeah. that could be regarded as part of the sample yeah. because it's not a loss of information to the book no. we wouldn't reinstate that into the sample okay. at, at any point so you might find that there's bits of pollen clinging onto those yeah, bits yeah. So i don't know so there's yeah some little particles just around here that are lifting onto the brush mm. i don't know if that's just dust or... oh there goes a bit That's the scientific term. It's a <laughs> weasel. 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 <laughs> Sounds like a name of a book. <laughs> TCL one four one three eight. Trinity College. So this was the, the no. In this case, it was the training college for the, for oh, the, the Church of Scotland here. Oh, right. Yeah, so it became part of the Church of Scotland. I see now, like they're named. So you can get more specific yeah, yeah. information here. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. I love how it's it's set up to look like a prayer book. Yeah. In a way. I suppose it's a, this is a souvenir to think about. Yeah. Cyclone, Annas. Are they the sorts of things you'd be looking at? Or is that? Yeah, because, see, yeah. that's a nice. Yeah. And also, when you get to these plants, which have these open, more open florets, mm -hmm. they, they want to distribute the pollen really widely. So they're relying on insects, but masses of pollen, and so actually it's much easier for that pollen to get released from the flower. Yep. And so, you just do the same thing, just kind of run around mm. over the... Yeah. I think there's little speck, little black specks around it on them, mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's just because you can see there's quite a lot of soot yeah. on this foot. Oh, yes. so I wouldn't be surprised if that's some of what you find right, okay. settling on them because uh, you see the undulations and the, yeah, yeah. the gaps, yeah. and the soot's been gathering in there. So soot's obviously come down through the head of the text box, so it might mm -hmm. be kind of sitting, sitting on the. So I wouldn't be surprised if you find quite a bit of that. All right. And so, Eileen, so when you brought the samples from that day in Glasgow back to your lab in Stirling, what, what did you find was in that, um, in that dust? So it, it, was, it was quite interesting because we had two books to Hoover. So one of the books um, just contained sort of arrangement of flowers from the Holy Land. And the other book actually had samples of pressed flowers sort of from the Holy Land. So there were slightly different books. And the book that actually gave the best results was the book that contained the actual flower 
samples themselves. And these were um, sort of uh, flowers that were quite, quite open. They had lots of different sort of individual florets on them. So they were quite a polyniferous plant species to begin with. So it was kind of the best shot we were going to have to find the pollen. And we did. We did find the pollen of that particular plant in, in the filter. So what this kind of gave me a lot of hope for was that these the, the pollen survived in those those conditions for that length of time and it was identifiable yeah. that was the case so you sometimes you see pollen you see fragments of it um but you can't identify it but here the actual kind of you know the the plant was identifiable as a, a plant as that species so it was um, a I think it's called Madonna flower, I think was the one, and it's Apiaceae, which is like a carrot, the wild carrot type family. And um, and there was there was pollen that's really distinctive of, of that particular family. So and really nicely preserved as well, which was so so that was the real surprise. Now that we have found well-preserved pollen grains in 120-year-old books, the next step in developing our proof of concept will be to examine the residue in books that are likely to have been taken outside, but don't have pressed flowers in them. And for this, it will be instructive to look at some travel books like The Bedecker's Guide, which were printed in Germany as of 1827. And there are lots of copies of them around libraries across Europe. And so that will be a, a, a useful kind of inroad into further developing this proof of concept. Now, ultimately, as a manuscript historian, I would like to know more about how people traveled with their books and whether they use their books outside. And to answer that question, I would like to look specifically at a few manuscripts that have water damage that suggests that they were used in an open way and carried outside, for example, in the rain. And so one of those is a, a, a manuscript with instructions for taking a procession. The opening at the incipit for that text for taking a procession has been water damaged. And you can see that the red ink has reconstituted and has run across the page a bit. And so what, is that a manuscript that has trapped pollen when it was open outside and being used in a procession, quite possibly in the springtime for this Easter procession? And can we find any pollen in that book as a result of its uh, presumed use in that form? Now, uh, a second example of a manuscript that was most likely open outside is, is a book of ours that has uh, this vigil of the dead that where the, the, the pages have become crumpled because they were wetted quite possibly with rainwater, again, used outside and then they dried, and when they dried, they shrunk somewhat. And I wonder whether this manuscript was used by somebody who was mourning the loss of a loved one at a gravesite and reading the Vigil of the Dead on behalf of the recently deceased person. And so this would be interesting if we could see further evidence that books were used in this way outside at the gravesite. Now, finally, for me, one of the most important questions concerns medieval manuscripts used uh, as guides to pilgrimage. And in particular, I'm thinking about one uh, made in the Southern Netherlands around 1500. It's a book of hours with extra texts to be said at sites around Jerusalem where uh, there were important shrines. And you can see in this opening that uh, the owner, whose name may have been Jan de Tromp, who was a bailiff in Ostenda, did he actually take this book with him uh, from the Netherlands to Jerusalem and use it at the various shrines where he's depicted well, in the site of the baptism at the Jordan River? Or was this manuscript and others like it, were they used as uh, guides to armchair pilgrimage and not actually intended uh, to be taken on, on physical journeys? And so we hope to test a number of these books. And we also hope that listeners will suggest other books, manuscripts, early printed books, et cetera, that are likely to have traveled and for which pollen analysis can help illuminate aspects of their reception. 
and the Scottish based team that is um, Eileen Tisdall, Kira McKee, Bob McLean, if he wants to come, and I are more than happy to travel anywhere to libraries and private collections to take samples to see if we can determine by investigating this pollen record where those books traveled. So please do get in touch. Right. Thank you, Kate and Eileen, for what was a, a really fascinating talk for me. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions. And um, if anybody does, I'll be taking a look at the, the um, Zoom chat for any questions. But do feel free to raise a hand um, and you should be able to unmute yourselves if I call upon you to ask a question. Let's see, I see that there's a question in the chat from Elizabeth Lawrence, who writes that there's a processional from Scion, as far as I remember, in the collection at St. John's Cambridge, which has clearly been caught either in the rain or by a vigorous aspergic, <laughs> yes, um, as a rubrication has run slightly on a couple of pages. Uh, but maybe, Elizabeth, you're not suggesting that this was used outside, but it, uh, are you? I don't think you are. Um, but that is an interesting aspect of uh, book use is that we um, might begin to think about the conditions under which they're read and how just normal conditions of use uh, play a role in um, damaging the, the parchment in various ways. And I'm trying in another project to try to put um, some terminology and to begin to categorize these forms of damage that can be reverse engineered onto forms of use. Thank you. It looks like Bob, Bob McLean has his hand raised. Bob, do you want to ask a question? You've probably heard enough from me in, uh, enough from me in the previous session and in the video, but I, I do have a question if, if I may. <clears throat> now, uh, we know that you know, environments are changing all of the time. So, if we're wanting to try and use this sort of technique to try and determine where a manuscript once was, how do we control for that change? You know, are the, the plants that are, say, in the Mediterranean today the same as they were as the ones that were there a thousand years ago? That's a great question. I think Eileen is best um, positioned to answer questions that have to do with actual botany. Eileen, do you want to step in? Yeah, so I can see some uh, in the chat as well. So um, so you, what you tend to use are plant communities. So it's very difficult to use an, act, an individual plant to tie um, to a, a geographical location. So you would use communities of plants. So here you would be looking for communities of Mediterranean type plants. There are one or two species that would be really distinctive, but I think that would be, you know, I think it would be really difficult to hope to find one of those. So you would look for communities of plants um, that would be, as I say, characteristic of the Mediterranean or the, you know, whatever part of the world you think your work has been to. So for the plant communities themselves, I'm going to say that maybe over a thousand years, um, there may not have been that much change from what you see today, from what you would have seen in the past. They may have changed in abundance or, um, you know, and some plants, you know, if you grew them for crop growth, for example, so you, we get to see changes in crop types, but it's the, you're not necessarily, as I say, looking for individual plant species, so that's quite difficult. It would be the communities of plants. So you're looking for the sort of typical plants that would allow you to say that the, the pollen has come from a geographical region. And it is a bit fraught. It's not super definitive because there's things like grasses, tend to be just grasses wherever you go on the planet. So that's the trick. So there are plants that are more useful than others. Mm -hmm. There are a couple other questions in the chat I see in the same general vein about, um, let's see, Elizabeth Lawrence asks whether pollen from cut flowers could get into a book from altar flowers, for example. And that does seem possible. Yeah, so that, that the problem there would be that as many of these cut flowers, 
because they're insect pollinated. They don't tend to have as much pollen. So unless the cut flowers were like the ones that we looked at in um, the books that we just originally hoovered. So if they're a, a, like those wild carrots that have these big flower heads on them, then they generate a lot of pollen. Whereas some of the flowers in the book, like cyclamen, for example, they tend to have their pollen quite deep down in the flower. So they would be harder for me to kind of get that out. So I knew there was pollen in those trap, nice folded over cyclamens, but obviously I couldn't rip them apart to take them out and take the flower, the anthers out to get the pollen. So there's a kind of a balance between um, what I want to do because of that and what the, the kind of curators would permit me to do. <laughs> And of course, that depends on collections as well. And this is one of the reasons that we began with books from 1900, which are semi-precious, but we didn't launch right into uh, medieval manuscripts. So we're going to work backwards in time um, as, as we perfect this technique and, and ensure that it's safe. Um, it's, a few other people have written, um, can you isolate... Uh, Andy Beebe writes, can you isolate DNA from a single pollen grain and hence identify species? Uh, oh, I think you can, but uh, I need to go to somewhere really amazing lab-wise to do that one. Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, DNA, you get a lot of contamination, so it would be quite, you have to be really certain that it came from the actual pollen so this I'm straying very dangerously into a bit that I don't really know an awful lot about but I do know that even pollen itself the contamination the issue of contamination that we face you know because what we want is when the, just the books have been opened but the books may have been then closed and then reopened somewhere else or you know it it there's a whole heap of ways that the pollen could actually get to the book. So that's this kind of issue about the taphonomy, about how would the pollen travel to that particular book? Mm -hmm. and, and so, yes, none of this is very certain, but I think part of it is nobody's ever really looked for. And I think that's the exciting part of it. It's actually, why not just go and have a look and see what is there and then think about well, what does that evidence kind of allow you to say about the way in which these books traveled and were used. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So I think here we are, we're building a, a package of evidence and we, I mean, there's rarely in history any proof. There's only evidence that you can build a case for and, and try to have evidence from uh, different sources. And the, the, the person who asked about whether altar flowers pollen could get into the book, um, that does seem possible. and. I mean, I think what we're, what I'm imagining is that a book might contain pollen trapped in it from its place of origin where it was made. It might contain um, pollen in it from places where it has traveled to if it was used outside. And it might contain pollen from say a local church. So we could have multiple layers of pollen and those are probably not datable but they, they can tell us that there is pollen from different geographies that have come together in a certain, in a particular book. Um, is, it, is that what you think too, Eileen? That would be ideal, <laughs> but um, part of the problem will be just the concentration of pollen, because although there's a lot of it in the air, you're still faced with how much of it actually lands on the book. So if it's only one or two pollen grains, then you're faced with trying to decide how did they get there. So you, you're trying to get as many pollen grains as possible. So mm. the best chance of that is if the book was actually outside. Yeah. So I see that, um, uh, that Ginny Grimm has written, she wonders whether it would be possible to analyze the residue from water, either in rainwater or holy water, which could have come from different sources. And that question came up uh, in regards to maybe testing stains that might have been tears. So people who are um, driven to, to tears from reading accounts of the passion, for example, and is it possible to um, analyze tear water? I, 
I don't, it turns out that that holy water has salt in it and it's really difficult to distinguish from tear water. And at any rate, that's that's a totally separate project and I um, it's it's not pollen. Um, and so we'll have to, that sounds like a different, a different grant altogether. Um, so we're gonna, we're, we're not gonna look at um, water residue for the moment. Um, but I think that this question of uh, books with the Office of the Dead that are presumably used outside could be a really good um, um, foothold or a, an entryway into uh, finding a, a mass of books that are likely to contain pollen. Yeah, um, I think that the key thing is that the books need to have been outside at the right time of year. So um, that would be the spring and the summer, the main times of year that there's a lot of pollen. So if anybody gets hay fever, then you'll know that there are peak times in the summer yeah. when, when the air is just full of pollen. And so that's when these books, ideally, it would be that they were then taken outside. In, with regard to the late medieval manuscripts that were largely made in Western Europe, that have texts in them that are designed to be read while walking around the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. uh, we know from other accounts that people generally tried to arrive in the Holy Land so that they could be at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at Easter time. And so that's actually a really prime time of year to be trapping pollen. So that sort of gives us hope that this avenue could be um, useful for that body of, of uh, books. Yeah, and then the next step, so I noticed in the chat as it went past, the next step is to then look at other reference collections. So look at other collections of plants that have come from the Holy Land and work out um, which plants would be most likely to have been flowering um, mm -hmm. at the time. And then in terms of pollen, can I then prep some of those samples, of herbarium samples to see, okay, can I see any distinctive pollen types from those? So there's a number of steps yet, but I think that the, the, it wasn't really worth my while investing all that effort just to find out that actually there wasn't any at all. So I think this needs to be kind of one step at a time. And as I say, this the, the step in which we looked for pollen in these books that were, you know, hundreds of years old, just over hundred years old. I mean, I was surprised that the pollen was that well preserved. So. So then the next step is to think, you know, okay, right, what's the next interim step? And that is to look for books that maybe aren't as old, but that you know have been outside. So you have, again, another better chance of finding uh, pollen in these particular pages. Yeah. Are there other, other questions from the audience? I'm just checking. Nobody has raised their hand yet. <laughs> I know that I'm going to be scrutinizing our manuscripts and rare books for signs of pollen debris, um, as well as looking out for pine pollen when I'm out walking. Just, the books, the worst thing is if people have cleaned the books and tidied them up and then that's no good, it's all gone. I need dirty books and first commas. <laughs> True, very, very neat and tidy librarians are a nemesis. Um, this is a problem with books that have been through the trade in the last 50 years or so, is that dealers and auction houses tend to clean them up and they just uh, destroy a lot of evidence about useware. And so it's good to find collections that haven't been cleaned very much. Belgium is great for that sort of thing. A nice, slightly neglected whole country of books um, with, that are full of dirt and pollen. Um, Belgium is really the go-to country, <laughs> uh, and there are. I, I think we're really looking forward to returning to Glasgow to to uh, to look at another batch, the next batch, to um, keep refining this method. Mm. So, Bob, do you have any thoughts about what we might look at next in Glasgow? You caught me in the middle of eating my sandwich while oh, no. was <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, I know amateur hour. The, the obvious, the obvious thing of, uh, I think, at this stage is to uh, is identifying, as you said earlier, examples that we strongly suspect of having been 
in another country. So mm -hmm. one, one example that I'm thinking of is that within our Tischendorf library collection, this was Constantin Tischendorf, the 19th century theologian, um, who was rather a rapacious collector of manuscripts in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, including the, the Codex Sinaiticus, in fact, was, was him who identified that and, and pillaged it from, from Egypt. Um, but um, we've got within that, that library, his own personal library, quite a number of 19th century travelogues of the Eastern Mediterranean. So we'll know that he has used those in that part of the world. Uh, and that would be an obvious corpus to have a little look at, I would think. But um, we can talk more about that later in case you've got other ideas, Kate. Terrific. I see Anna has written that uh, they have a manuscript. I'm not sure which Anna this is. Uh, Anna with a manuscript that has been cleaned, but the results have been saved and we're waiting for the right person to study it all. So this is fantastic. Um, if we're on it. That sounds like a like a challenge. I do have a few more suggestions as well. So Elizabeth Henderson suggesting herbals, many of which have pressed plant specimens within them. Um, and Daryl Green suggesting early lending libraries like Leighton and in a Peffrey. So plenty of scope um, in terms of types of materials to look at and places to go. And that was Anna Welch in um in Melbourne. So do you fancy taking the Hoover on the road to Melbourne? <laughs> oh yeah, it's very noisy, but um, it seems to work. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, borrowing um, lending libraries. So Daryl Green has suggested looking at, uh, at lending libraries. That's a great idea. Although, I mean, I wonder to, how what's the extent of their lending how far are they lent are they lent uh beyond britain for example i imagine that most of the the flora within britain is fairly stable I, scotland is a bit different from the southern bits of england um i wonder how much difference there is in the pollen record between the north and the south of the british isles uh, um mm. Probably not enough, if you see what I mean, unless you get some uh, really distinctive plant. But then again, you're 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 hunting for one plant. You're what you're really looking for is, is enough pollen to say something about the the range of the community of plants that typify a particular geographical region. So this will be most useful for showing that somebody from Britain or from the continent has taken a book to. Egypt to Jerusalem to uh, to India to Goa someplace like that. Um, so you want them you want them to have taken the book, opened the book in this other destination. Lots of lovely pollen to have landed on the pages, and then they just closed the book, and yeah. then they never opened it again. Or if they did open it, they opened it inside on a winter's evening, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, this are your the, the two people who annoy you in history are people who clean their books and people who only read in winter. <laughs> no, I don't mind the winter readers as long as they don't go outside. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, let's see, there are several other questions here. They're going by really quickly now. Um, let's see, there's Deborah Davis saying that they have a curious object in our collection, a medicine chest that we suspect was at Culloden Moor. Um, actually, Deborah, do you want to just Open your your video and tell us about this object. Um, sure, if if you'd like. Um, sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I, I don't know if it's beyond your scope. I mean, I just I um, we we I work at the the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and we have a a, a chest from Sir Stuart Threedland who um, serviced Bonnie Prince Charlie. And so we kind of talk about how we believe that the box that was given to us was the box at Culloden Moor. Um, and so there's an index inside of it, but see, I wondered, cause I thought, oh, well, that would be so great. I mean, I'm sure we could compare, but we're not sure. We don't know how to prove that it was at Culloden Moor during the battle of Culloden. Um, but it, this seems like such an interest, but again, I'm so sorry, because this is an object and this isn't a book. And so I, I shouldn't be speaking at all, I feel. But um, yeah, there is an index inside. It's, it's very, very worn and very 
uh, very much used, um, but it is paper, but I didn't know if maybe papers or correspondence might not fall within this purview because it would be moved around so much that it would be difficult. Anyway, th those are my thoughts. <laughs> what do you think, Eileen? Oh, that's really interesting, but, um, you know, but you'd have to find, uh, you know, lots of birch and lots of heather and so those sorts of plants to have even a, a chance of assigning it to Culloden. But if he took it lots of different places, then you'll get a sort of muddle of signatures and pollen from all of the different places that he took it. So unless he took it to Culloden and then never used it ever again, <laughs> then you might be able to see something. But you would always be in that kind of, it would be a bit ambiguous. But I mean, it would be really interesting though as well to, to take a look. I can see that the title of the article is going to be a pollen muddle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Matthew Collins notes that they're looking at wax seals and wax should also contain some pollen for comparative, uh, which may offer comparative information. So that yeah. is potentially of interest. I have to destroy it though. That might mm. not <laughs> right. Um, let's see. And Bob, do you want to talk about scripture for a second for the 16th and 17th centuries, Bob? It's so not much nicer when you say it. You keep it coming at me when I've had a, a full mouthful of sandwich. Oh, right. <laughs> you, you wear it I well. Was, I would just say, it, it, um, it reminds me that um, certainly those those in the 16th century who you might call Puritan, who would have self-identified as, as as the godly, quite often enjoyed or, or, or talk about the merits of, of daily reading of scripture and very often reading outside in the natural world. So that's this, if we can, if we can kind of have that correlation between Puritan owners of 16th, 17th century Bibles um, and uh, un, un, survive in an unbound state, um, we might well uh, have good candidates for, for surviving uh, pollen in there. So that's another category that we might think about, I suppose. That's all I would say. Fantastic. I, I live right next to Arthur's seat and I see people carrying all kinds of things, you know, reading material, um, computers. Um, somebody was carrying a pizza up there the other day, but I can imagine Puritans with their uh, their liturgical reading going to the top of the mountain. That's a really good idea. Um, there are so many questions here. Uh, Eileen, do you want to look at these as well? Um, and, and Melanie, can you? Uh, yeah, I can field them. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, mind. So Julie Gardham says that so many medieval manuscripts have been rebound and presumably this destroys pollen evidence too. It will do, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. And we've got a bit of a debate <laughs> going on um, about Puritan spaces of reading. So I will let that one resolve itself first. Um, and yes, so Lara Haggerty. So there's potential for discerning the provenance of books for in a pefray rather than journeys of borrowing. Um, so some good suggestions and people are really reflecting on what they've heard in your talk and thinking about their own collections and what lies within them. Um, uh, oh, this is a great comment from uh, Robert Betteridge. Yeah. Well, Never bugs. very pleasant to find, <laughs> but squash bugs and books must be a mine of similar information. Oh, yeah, they would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, because you can get, as I say, similar to plants, there are insects that are, you know, really distinctive and you know you can attribute them to a particular part of the world and a particular environment as well so they're they're brilliant yes Good. well you by all means keep comments coming through the chat but um i am going to thank kate and eileen for a really fascinating and thought-provoking talk and move on to introduce our next speaker who is professor matthew collins um he's affiliated to the university's of Copenhagen and Cambridge and supports a team of postdoctoral and PhD students who are exploring the potential of parchment as a biomolecular archive. He himself started out as a marine zoologist, held postdoctoral positions in biochemistry and chemistry labs, lectured in environmental geochemistry before becoming an archaeologist. 
Um, so that's quite a career path there. Um, and Matthew's going to be talking to us. The title of his presentation is How to Read a Book, How Simple Protein Screening Aids the Study of Parchment Manuscripts. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, you can. Uh, so I'm talking about a project which is going to really encompass many individuals and uh, has been really ongoing now for almost a decade, in fact. And it's kind of about because of this idea that parchment, so specifically parchment, is a really rich biomolecular archive. And the reason we became interested in it is because of a poor student I had who was a, a veterinarian and he was trying to understand animal management practices by analyzing bone. And we looked at the site in Scotland. He did very, very careful work on the site. But out of 4,000 bone fragments, there was only enough individual pieces of bone which were intact to identify 29 animals. And from 29, animal, 29 animals spanning the Iron Age and the Viking Age, you couldn't really say very much about the practice of management. Whereas when, of course, you come to an archive or a library, you have thousands upon thousands of items of animal skin. And each animal only has one skin. And so therefore, we have thousands upon thousands of, of animals. So this is a project which is, I say, many, many individuals. Uh, this are uh, just a, a few of the team. Very fun, fortunately fundamented, I, I would say, by the European Research Council, which has been great at funding these kind of interdisciplinary research projects, um, and also by the Danish uh, National Research Funding Council. And when you think about parchment objects, you think about rare books, you can think about them in lots of different scales. And I think we all think about them at these different scales. We, we, we want to think about them within the context of the much wider geography um, that these books inhabit. We can also think about them at the scale of the individual library, of the book object itself, or as you heard from the, the first talk this morning, we can even go down to micro scale and analyze very, very small parts of individual pages or folio. So we have this huge scale problem with these kind of objects. I think any of us starting on a new project are only ever going to begin with relatively few samples. And hopefully, as uh, databases become more integrated and metadata becomes more connected, we're able to pull together larger data sets to explore uh, more of this corpus of material we have. But at the same time, we have that problem of scale. And uh, what I want to, when I started this project out, it was very much around the idea of, of the book as an object, uh, the container of information. As I mentioned, you know, the books are typically written on parchment, bound in leather, often between oak boards, and then they are stitched with various kinds of stitch, stitches from mainly plant-based materials. And so all of those are carrying biological records. And I guess the I was influenced by some of the work um, of the scholar Bruce Holdinger. And Bruce was interested in sort of the, the connected medieval world. And what I saw from these, I, these objects was the idea that they all contained DNA. And DNA was the really exciting molecule, still is, um, at that time. And the kind of the idea that in the same way you have a genealogy of individuals, you would actually have a genealogy of every single one of these pieces of parchment because they're all deriving from uh, the skin of an animal who had two parents and two parents who begat those two, four parents begat those two parents. And so every single item of parchment had this kind of genetic connectivity very much in the same way that people who are studying, for instance, correspondence and um, in this case, this big study by uh, Stanford University on just looking at the world of letters and the connectivity, we have this idea of a connected world. And so in that connected world, documents, manuscripts moving around, and the idea was 
we could learn a lot from studying the DNA. What I'm going to talk about though is not DNA at all. It's going to be talking about proteins. And this is really analysis at a much coarser scale. And if we think about DNA and we think about proteins, I mean, DNA is copies um, of partial DNA that you get half from your mother, half from your father, and it's stored in a library in your cell, the nucleus. And to me, as a small, uh, a young boy growing up, I always wanted my father, he never did, to buy a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica, because in my view, this was all the information in the world. And if I had this, it would be phenomenal because I would then somehow know everything. Um, but it's certainly in the case of the DNA that makes up all of us, it's all the information that's required to make us. And actually then a lot of information which seems to be padding, um, text padding, just, just to make sure that the, the individual chapters and individual uh, blocks of information that, um, that make the proteins are able to be read at the right time. What happens is that that DNA and it's taken out of the nucleus, it's taken into the kitchen. It's like, it's like you essentially take this beautiful ob ob book object in, in the nucleus, you copy out a transcript on a piece of thin tissue paper, you take it out into the kitchen, and that is instructions on how to make the proteins, and the proteins are the things that make all the molecular machinery in us. So what, what they're much more like really is a kind of a daily newspaper. They're about what is happening at any one moment in time. And of course, that will vary from time to time, from space to space, whatever is actually happening in a cell. So the, the proteins are dynamic. It's telling about activity. But it's much, much less information. Think how less informative a newspaper is than a complete encyclopedia. It's only partial information. So we've already heard about the way that we can take this book, job, book object um, um, from the first presentation uh, and do sort of physical and chemical analysis on it. Um, what we are then trying to do is do more biomolecular analysis. And we're then trying to link it up with paleography, codicology, and visual analysis. We're trying to put all this information together. Now, the issue with DNA is it's so costly that we can generate very few samples. The advantage of working on proteins is that we have a method which is in effect so cheap that for all libraries, it's free. I mean, up until now, for the last decade, we've been able to raise enough funding that no one ever has to pay for the analysis that we do for them. Um, and the biggest advantage, and this is why I really want to most reflect, is it's not an analysis which is done by us. We don't make decisions on the samples that we analyze. What this is, it's a realization very early on that um, the importance of these documents meant that they will be handled by conservators and not by scientists. Um, and so we therefore came up with an analysis which uses a conservation treatment, which is the use of the dry eraser. And in particular, we came up with the use of the waste products of that treatment. And that means simply that anyone in any library, any part of the world, that has a set of Eppendorf tubes from us, which just got labels on them. There's nothing special about those tubes. We'll send you out a Mars Staler eraser. We'll send you out some gloves. Um, and then the conservators can essentially collect samples as part of conventional um, conservation practice. And they can keep those because those dry eraser rubbings have actually extracted small amounts of DNA and small amounts of protein. And depending on the size of the amount uh, of, of eraser waste that's been collected, um, they can then potentially even use it for, for DNA analysis, but it can sit in a drawer, forgotten, until there's enough waste to become interesting for analysis. And that is actually quite remarkable because there are almost no other methods I can think of of protein extraction, which once you've extracted the protein or the DNA, you don't have to store it in the fridge or a freezer until you take it for analysis. But in this case, the, the, ways, the razor crumbs can be stored into a little um, a tube, and inside this tube, um, it can be left for years. Eventually, it'll arrive back in the laboratory. In the laboratory, what will happen is that the protein will be extracted from the eraser crumbs, 
and that is a protein from the parchment that has been used for the conservation treatment. We also do analyze some leather samples, and we've also attempted, usually without great success, to analyze glues. And what happens then is the, um, the eraser crumbs are extracted and proteins removed from them. They are then essentially introduced into a mass spectrometer. Um, and that piece of analysis that's done in the lab is relatively straightforward. Um, and it means that it, it's possible to, to measure uh, multiple samples uh, in a week. And um, I think the largest number of samples analyzed by a single PhD student on a highly different project on bone was it was over 5,000 over the course of a PhD um, uh, study. So the large numbers can be analyzed by this technique. And when we then just think about um, a book object, um, what we have done in effect is if you think about a, a, a folia, and within that folia, you realize it's made of animal skin. Within that animal skin, it's actually dominated by one protein, the protein collagen. And this is a lovely video. It actually takes you through a piece of skin and you can see these bits of rope, these, these protein ropes, which make up the skin They're in different orientations as shown by this white arrows, it sort of swings around. And what this video is gonna do is then zoom right in um, on an individual collagen fibril. And rather like a piece of rope, this is made up of a series of uh, um, protein sequences. And in fact, it's actually a unit set of five different chains wrapped around together. When I say chains, it's actually chains of triple helical collagen. You take one of those chains out and it itself is actually made of three chains. So, it's, so your skin is made of this layering of a molecular rope. And what you are then doing to do the species identification is to analyze that protein for differences. And actually that's quite a difficult problem because that molecular rope, as you saw from the video, is extremely long. Um, it's a thousand building blocks or amino acids. You can think of them here as uh, bees on a chain. And there are three chains. Two of the chains are actually the same, the third one is different. Um, but it's like trying to spot a needle in a haystack to see the differences between species. And they have, you have to work, look really hard. And the needle I'm looking at now, I can't even see the difference between here, a sheep and a goat. And between sheep and goat, there are 2,000 amino acids of, um, in the two chains, but only two of those are different. So you have to spot those differences. And if you did that by um, a sequencing technology, it would simply be too difficult. Um, so the way it's done is we basically um, take advantage of the particular properties of collagen, which is the protein that makes up parchment. And we've heard before, you know, if, if, if parchment gets wet, we can see it because it begins to gelatinize. And the gelatinization process, um, it also gelatinizes if it gets damaged, is the unraveling of those protein chains. And that unraveling process means it's actually quite simple for us to take the eraser rubbings, and then by heating them, we unravel the chains of uh, parchment, um, collagen, convert it into gelatin, and once it's in the form of gelatin, it's then amenable to being cut into small pieces. And so we do that with an enzyme, which is the very same enzyme that you use to digest protein in your uh, intestine. And um, what that does is to generate lots of small peptides. And the reason we do that is because these small peptides are um, the scale, the size at which this mass spectrometer that we use can measure the mass difference. So it's helpful to have masses that can be measured accurately. It has a second advantage though, um, that if you have sequences which are essentially identical, then when you have taken this collagen and cut it with the enzymes, the different masses shown here, these are small masses, down the bottom in this figure, but base here, this is the mass range from small to large. And this is sort of an indication of intensity. Um, the masses will all be the same. So the fingerprints will look identical if the samples are identical. But however, within that forest of masses of small to large masses, if you have a difference in a sequence as shown here, 
what that results in is a change in mass, a mass shift. And that what that mass shift does is it means that that difference is easy to spot. So where you have a forest of identical masses, a single difference is actually quite easy to spot. And that means by looking merely for the differences, we can see the difference between a sheep and a goat, or a calf, or a deer. And so it means that it takes a very little time. In fact, it takes something like a second to conduct this analysis. And so this rather nice system in which the samples can be collected by conservators, accumulated over time, and then one sent to the, to the laboratory in a fairly short space of time, we can generate species identification of the parchment. And so what that has meant now is that we can actually work at quite large scale ranges. Um, at the moment, I think it's something like 7,000 manuscript documents across Europe have been analyzed, but in fact, we are now struggling to get the metadata compatible to make any sense of that information, but that's something we're working on at the moment. And that's actually a big challenge moving forward is how we can agree on, for instance, the way we describe the source of an object. Um, is it from the low countries? Is it from Belgium? Where, is it from a specific town in Bruga? Or do we not know its origin? What is its time period, et cetera, et cetera. So we have lots of problems at the moment with the way that the objects we have analyzed have been documented. But this one study, a really interesting study, I think by the University of Namur, decided to study a complete Cistercian library. And so their project called Pergamenum 21 uh, focused on the Abbey or Val. The reason they focused on this particular uh, site was that it, it's, it's a Cistercian monastery with a relatively small corpus of work. And it has, it's now held in Luxembourg and the catalog of all the manuscripts had been completed. So this was a kind of the scale is, is now possible. And what this team did is they uh, collected all this material um, and then they sampled um, the different identifiable codecological units, some of which had been uh, bound together so that it's not just the books from the Luxembourg Liga, it's the units. And then within the units, they analyzed individual folia. Um, so that they could get a sense of the species composition within each of these units that have been identified. Um, and we began this project not knowing what we would find. We knew that we'd find predominantly cow or calf, sheep and goat. We imagined that because calf skin, and this is data from Bewley Abbey, um, uh, that the calfskin is valued more highly than sheepskin, that perhaps the books which were considered of greater value were produced on calfskin. We also imagined that we might see some geographical patterning um, in the origin of these texts, which were not scribed uh, in Oval, but had been acquired by the library. Um, the results we got back this is the, the overall summary of all of the objects. Um, if those colored in the kind of reddish color are goat, yellow is sheep, blue is calf, gray is indeterminate, and orange, which you see quite frequently here, is a mixture of sheep and goat, or is sheep goat, which can't be discriminated because that particular uh, peptide that we knew need to tell them apart was missing, but the majority actually were a mixture of sheep coat. And you can see here that we have text produced outside Orval and text produced within the library. And there is really uh, the only variation you see is that there's variability, I think. Um, you can see that in the very earliest texts that are acquired, they're predominantly on sheepskin. Uh, the production in the Abbey itself is a really a mixture of calf and sheep with a limited amount of goat. Um, and then uh, there is a sort of shift towards slightly more calf, perhaps, in some of the later acquisitions, but there's really a real mixture. And so you ask yourself, well, why is this? Well, it could be origin. I mean, the problem with this is that many of the, the texts we have no origin for. Um, we have 
Italian, limited the numbers are so small, we would imagine more goat, it's actually sheep. Uh, the low countries are mixed with sheep and goat, uh, perhaps you have a bit more cattle, but and, and all that itself is is predominantly um, sheep and, and calf, which actually from the limited information we've got on the husband husbandry practices around that particular monastery is what we might expect from that particular site. Um, when we look at it in terms of the, the nature of the different texts, again, there's nothing really very obvious. Um, the most striking thing, I think, is the fact that Bibles are, uh, the small number of Bibles are all produced on calfskin, um, grammar and rhetoric on, on sheepskin, but there is a range of variability here. And it's not as we assumed the simple, simply a, a link between a particular type of book and the value, perceived value of the book. One of the things we haven't shown here, but was attempted was by looking at the quality of the, the scribal work, the quality of the illustrative work to try and make a sense of, of quality. But again, we didn't see any link between our quality index or their quality index and the, uh, the difference in species. So we don't really see very much change. In, well, we see, we, see, we see continual variation, I suppose, in the library. And the only thing which we, is maybe perhaps striking is that in the very early texts acquired uh, and written before the foundation, um, what we're looking at is mainly uh, sheep and a little bit of goat. Um, this is very different, though, when we came to the legal texts. And in the legal texts, of course, these are charters. They have dates written upon them, so we know when they were produced. Um, not much of range in thickness, which is shown on, on the y-axis here. On the x-axis here, we have the year of production. And we can see that early on, we have um, some calf, um, but then later, everything is produced on, on, on sheep. So here, instead of having that, much, that variability that we saw amongst the, 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 the codices, we now have this kind of quite clear pattern of a shift to sheepskin. And that's quite late. So the, these dates, we're seeing calf um, uh, um, charters being written up to the early part of the 13th century. What's interesting for us is that if you look at this text from the Dialogues of the Exchequer, which is written in the 12th century, the late 12th century, by Richard Fitzneil. He is actually saying, so this is an English text, they're re-establishing the Exchequer after the, the Civil War um, between Stephen and Maud. And he's, he has the, the son of the then Bishop of Ely, so they're probably taking documents from Ely to, to re-establish practice. Um, and he's saying that, we should, that you should write legal documents on sheepskin, because um, sheepskin, they're, they're not easily erased without it being obvious. So that's a practice which is happening, at least apparently from here a century earlier in England, that we're now seeing a, maybe shifting across the continent of Europe a century later. And so um, when we've now analyzed a very large number of legal documents, and this is one of the spectra what we're looking for here is the unique markers for sheep and goat, but a range of documents um, spanning um, 800 years and 99.9% .9 of English legal documents, essentially all of them pretty much, are written on sheepskin. So this becomes a standard practice, and which is curious because if you speak to parchment makers, the least popular of the skins to work on is sheep. And the reason for that is because the large amount of fat within the, the manuscripts itself, within the skin, which requires greater work to remove. And um, it's just a, it, it's a harder material to prepare than either calf or goat. And whilst it might be a practice which would be common in England due to the importance of the medieval uh, wool production, it's kind of interesting to think about maybe it's transmission elsewhere in Europe as a standard practice for legal documents, which perhaps, perhaps is what we're seeing a century later in Orval, 50 years later in Orval. What is interesting about though now is a, a PhD, so a master student, Billy Mills, has just completed her dissertation actually on looking at legal texts from Ely at the time that Richard is writing. And she again finds that almost <laughs> All the documents are written on sheepskin, but she is finding this particular document, the Vanek Archive, 
which is written on calfskin. And it has quite an interesting uh, structure to it in the way that uh, the seal tag is produced is slightly different. And so we're now sort of very intrigued by this particular that we've, she's found a second one um, uh, held in the British Library. And we're kind of intrigued now to work out whether this was a particular style that was used on calfskin, or this just happened to be um, a calfskin document. It wasn't produced in Ely, it, which was where, of course, we believe Rich was developing practice from. This was actually produced um, in an outlying area, somewhat disconnected from uh, the cathedral. So we can look at a library and we can begin to think about a library. If any of you heard me talk before, you've heard me talk about this book, The Gloss Luke. This is the very first thing we analyzed. But this, is, this gives you an idea of what you might find if you analyzed a single book. I think this is a great story. Perhaps it's such a good story we won't ever repeat a uh, similar story again. But this is a, this is a document produced um, at Saint, in St. Augustine's Abbey in the middle of the 12th century. It's about the same time that Richard is writing, um, and it's in its original binding. And uh, we were asked originally to identify the species of the leather binding. Um, when we did that, um, what we found was that um, the leather was not, as we'd anticipated, perhaps naively, uh, calf skin, but it was actually made, made of deer skin. Um, this was of no particular interest. It just happened to be deer skin until, until we talked to Naomi Sykes, who's a zooarchaeologist at the University of Exeter, who had been studying fallow deer. And she become, had become very interested in deer and the way that deer are being exploited in the medieval period. And she highlighted the sort of the way in which deer are seen as vigorous animals. Um, they are they're here in the case of Landolf, they're, they're, they're King Otto, as he lays sick, is wrapped in, in the deer skin. And also she's, she was interested in the ways in which deer were seen as important animals, they were hunted. And here we have the monks in the Abbey of Saint-Denis who are requesting from Charlemagne, could they kill deer destroying crops? And he says they can, as long as they bind their missiles in deer skin. And the thing that really had struck Naomi was the fact that when she had looked at different sites, and particularly when she compared monastic or religious sites with other sites, a very high preponderance of roe deer in these sites, which she argues is because of the humoral theory. And the humoral theory, um, in her view, you know, was encouraging the monks to, to eat these meeker animals and not the animals which are associated with hunting. So we have a, a, a text bound in, in roe deer skin. Um, we actually can't identify which of the two deer species are involved in making the thicker uh, leather band. But when we analyze the, uh, the remaining text, it has this very curious structure, um, which is dominated by calf and sheep. Um, in the case of the work at Abbey or Val, generally speaking, what we were seeing there was a block, if we saw a mixture, so a block of sheep and then a block of goat. We weren't seeing mixing like this. This was something that I think is probably quite common just based on visual inspection from Canterbury and St. Augustine um, at this time, even from the monastery. Um, but what we see here is this kind of curious structure of each of the choirs with calf and sheep. And if we look at choir four, if you compare it to all the others, all the others begin with calf. This one has sheep on the outside. Uh, so a kind of very curious structure. It then sort of a structure which we put at the very beginning appears to break down. We go to high proportion of calf, we have a bit of goat. We go back to the original structure and they end up with, with um, uh, sheep. Um, one thing that Erzy Vucnik, who's part of the project, has been doing is to use the information that we're find, finding to begin to reconstruct the animals. And here, what he's finding when he looked through this text was that um, the choirs are being assembled from a skin after a skin after a skin. So we're seeing one skin and then another and another, which is implying that uh, these skins are being used in order. Um, sometimes we're only finding half, this is half uh, of a sheep here, um, and another half of sheep there, and then the front half of, the, of a goat skin. And if you look at the goat skin, 
it's of rather poor quality. It's got various pock marks on it. It's not really, really even big enough for the text. Um, the curious thing then about the goat skin is that it's, it's occurring at a point just after the scribes that, that scribe this gloss Luke or, or the central Luke, the, the original biblical text of the Luke changes hands. And uh, uh, Bruce Barker Benfield that did this work identified the scribe one as a, a scribe he'd seen before uh, many times. He thought he was a very skilled scribe. And then the second scribe he sees as being less skilled in his penmanship, there was more error. Uh, the, the gloss, this is a gloss text, the gloss on the, on, the, on, on the sides of the main text, they are in a, another five hands potentially. So there's, there's a glossing is being done by the scribes, but the central text of Luke, which would have been written first, is two um, separate scribes. And when you look at the text, what you see is that the positioning of the goat is interesting. And again, it was a uh, a biblical scholar of mine who, who pointed out to me that, and I was completely unaware of this, that goat is only mentioned once in the Gospel of Luke. And the, the story of the prodigal son in which this story of, of the, the mention of, of goat or kid, a young goat being used by the, uh, the son that he doesn't even get this, the son that, that has been staying at home away from the father, that the text is being written here on, on, on this particular folio, page 106. Um, and then what we see in the next choir, we see that half a flea bitten goat. And when you then realize that the, the, the point at which the scribes change is the following choir, it does make you think a little about the processes going on in the mind of the first scribe. And the point at which they're, they're putting together a structure which, given the number of samples of, of calf and sheep, could have almost certainly gone right the way through the text, almost, of this mixed calf and, and sheep. And my suspicion is that the, the original scribe at this point is realizing he won't be able to complete the whole text, so he just uses up the remaining calf material. And then as he's leaving, the last thing he's scribing is this, is this section of Luke, which includes the story of the prodigal son. And because the son has never been given a, a kid to make merry with their friends, he inserts the front half of the flea bitten goat. And this is very unusual in English manuscripts. You see extremely few examples of goat skin in English manuscripts. Then he starts on the next choir, folded as all the previous choirs. And then the second scribe takes over, but he can't command, he's not such a good scribe, perhaps the same quality of, uh, of, of parchment. And in fact, if you actually look at the quality of this parchment, it actually goes down with time. So, to my mind, this is telling us something about the organization of the book, but also something potentially, or we can't, of course, prove it, about the agency of the scribes themselves. We can then use this kind of approach to think more about more complicated texts. And so in here now, we are starting a project looking at a palimpsest. And uh, palimpsests are, are very common. Um, and here in a palimpsest, of course, I think you all know that you're, you're taking an original text or a series of texts and then you're erasing the original uh, text and then uh, using that to write a new document. And this is um, a, a, a book from the collection of the University of Copenhagen. In fact, it's the earliest text in their collection. Um, it's written a single hand, um, but it's thought to have been comprised from a range of much earlier documents. So even though it's scribed quite, quite early, it's actually thought to be made of even early documents. So this is some, uh, we believe to be probably Spanish or possibly Portuguese parchment dating from perhaps the 10th century and perhaps even earlier. When we look at this parchment, um, we can conduct a visual examination of the parchment. And this visual examination, which is done by the uh, conservation and, and co ecological team, they've been working on this document for some time. You can see that there are a range of different possible uh, groups. Uh, the end leaf is, is definitely different again. What we have done, as you can see here, oh, is analyze the species composition, sorry. And the species composition here is, is very mixed. Um, as befits a Spanish document, it's made mainly of sheep and goat. We see that very commonly in that part of the world, which would be consistent with those species being used. But again, it's not using um, a single species, it's much more mixed. This is a very complicated structure, but of course it's a palimpsest. And as I say, when you actually then 
inspect the document, it looks like uh, the first element um, is all of sheep, the next element is all of goats, and comes probably from a different component. Um, the, the next element possibly also comes from the first element, and so forth. And then the last group is maybe a separate manuscript. I mentioned to you previously the idea of doing the spectral analysis, which is now I've got tucked off the bottom of the screen here, where we, I, we measure a spectrum, and the spectrum is the intensity of all the separate peaks. These are the fingerprints of the parchment. Um, what we have here is the, the grouping of goats and sheep. Again, the red is goat, the yellow is sheep. But what's happened here is we've taken those complicated spectra and turned them into data cubes. And in those data cubes of just the message which has been found across all of this data, they're colored and the intensity reflects the intensity of which those were measured. So we have orange is intense and blue is less intense from low to high masses. These are all the various folia. But what's interesting about this, if you go back to look at the previous structure and you start to look at the cluster analysis, what you're starting to see here is that there is a grouping. For instance, one group of goats is actually linked back to this later goat scheme here. And despite the same species, the earliest goat data um, corresponds to this, what appears to be a second element of uh, the palimpsest. And so this is really surprising and rather exciting to us. It's very new work. We haven't finished the work yet. We're hoping to get some better um, imaging uh, with more spectral imaging of the, of the undertext, although the undertext is extremely hard to read. It's been very effectively removed in, in most of these befolia. But it seems that beyond merely being able to tell apart sheep from goats, we seem to be here having structure in the samples and that structure is actually reflecting something more about these species of uh, these samples. And given we're seeing structure where some goat are actually clustering the sheep, it's not species which is relevant. It seems to be linked to the different components of the palimpsest. And perhaps that's reflecting differences in the way that the surface was removed. Of course, this has been analyzed using an eraser method, and we are looking at the surface. But equally more excitingly, perhaps it's actually telling us something about differences in the manufacturing process. And what is exciting more than that then is we don't just have this particular document. As I mentioned, we have 6,000 parchment documents from all across time and space in Europe. And so what we're now trying to do is build a much larger data cube of all of that data. We have to correct for, correct for batch effects, which reflect where the machines are being run and uh, etc. But if we've done that, will we start to see broader structure within all the parchment documents across Europe? And what is that telling us if we find it? We can also incidentally uh, try and measure um, the level of damage of the parchment. But again, we've done this in this case because we found often that that links the quality of parchment. But here you can see it's a pretty scattered data set. Um, if we have a high value for parchment quality in ducts up here, uh, that indicates a high quality parchment. Um, so these, these ones are high quality, if you can see my screen, yes. Um, and these ones are worse quality, but there's no obvious pattern really within the, within the context of qu parchment quality. For instance, these goats are very, very variable in quality. These goats are of slightly higher quality. So, but there does seem to be greater structure in the overall um, mass fingerprint. And again, we can reassemble these, and now it's much more helpful because we have the data based upon the actual manuscripts themselves. And what we can see there is we can then see this is a bit of goat skin. And in the goat skin, we can measure the size of this kid. And this is a, really, a relatively small animal. Um, the last thing that we can then do is we can go and analyze the individual constituent stains. Remember, this is a surface analytical technique. Um, and if we do that, as we've done here, this is on a, uh, a birthing scroll. So you can analyze individual stains on the birthing scroll. Uh, these are the different proteins, and this is a different type of analysis. This is a more complex, more expensive analysis, but we see presence of um, the protein associated with raw jelly. We see milk proteins. We see proteins associated with peas. And um, what we were able to do in this case, or I wasn't, but my um, medieval historian colleagues were able to do, was to look at the various salves and, 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 and that have been uh, proposed and then link the, the possible 
presence of particular proteins associated with these different materials to possible cells that were used, and also because of the presence of proteins associated with vital fluid, we can say this is almost certainly uh, very closely associated with the birthing process, uh, it's probably potentially worn during the birthing process. And given the fact that many of these were destroyed and very little was written about uh, the experience of women, very little at all, I think nothing at all, about the experience of women um, in childbirth in medieval periods, this kind of record could be very helpful. So, I mean, that's really all I want to uh, stress at the moment. What I want to say then is that when you think about this kind of analysis, and it's one of many we've heard about uh, today, and we've heard these kind of exciting new developments in the accessibility to this sort of analysis um, at a UK and a European scale, um, we can hope, I think, to see in the future that we can begin to integrate together more of this data, data on the material properties of these objects, on the pigments we've heard about previously from um, a talk from Durham, but also uh, the overview that you got from, uh, from uh, the first presentation from Laura. Excellent. And, and then we can uh, look at things like the structure. So we can begin to pull together, as you saw in those images, uh, the structure of the document. And we want to be able, of course, to say where we have sampled from. At the moment, we're saying we sampled from part of the bifolia, but as you saw from stains, it actually matters where you sample from. And in Kate's earlier projects, the Dirty Books project, one free name project, I mean, she was looking at the handling. So you imagine if you look at the, the, the parts of a, a document you're handled, then actually you're going to pick up much more of the human interaction with the kissing or the touching of the books than you will actually the, the animal origin of the text themselves. And I think the final thing that we are very conscious of now is that individual library catalogs are not always consistent in the way that they actually describe objects. And we need to link together this, this metadata so we need to find ways that we can essentially join up all of the dots to start seeing these larger patterns that are beginning to appear. But I think it's for me, the, the key point is it's something that where we have not gone out to uh, target a particular space or a particular time. We've just essentially allowed samples to come into the laboratories. And by analyzing the samples that come into the laboratories, we've been able to explore patterns. And we're still only, I think, at the very beginning of mining the surface of this data. So yeah, so finally, just to, to thank everybody um, that was involved in this project. Um, from Ismail that did the data cubing, Erji that examined them, uh, Vladimir who did the image analysis, Albert who developed Visical, Natasha conservative looking at the, the Spanish document, Sarah who actually developed all the methodology, Matthew from the Argaman Institute, Argaman Institute, and then Laura who is the uh, the PhD student who's been working on um, this uh, particular palimpsest document. And I've very final note that I have added in case it's useful to some of you. Um, a list of various texts um, that, that you can read. And there's a, a, a web link. And I think the first people to access, for six people to access the web link, can actually download all the PDFs from this list. And that's associated with this particular session. And with that, I will, um, I'll stop. Melanie, you're on mute. Yeah, Melanie. Was... Sorry, I'd pressed it twice. Um, we've got just five minutes for questions, but maybe people would like to continue um, the conversation via the chat and the community section of um, the Hoover site. But I have seen some comments already coming in. Um, so somebody has asked, Sarah Charles asks, can you tell whether the animal is male or female? Or the age of the animal when it was killed? Yes, we can. So it was one of the interesting things we found is um, that we are, every time we predict the sex of the animal, we seem to get it wrong. So we looked at an object which was produced in um, three years before a terrible moraine had wiped out most of the cattle in Britain, uh, just before the start of the 11th century. Uh, so it was 996. Um, and we imagine, therefore, that 
this beautiful text must be made on is on calf skin. We've made on male calves because if you just had a huge moraine, surely you want to build your stocks up again. Um, in a small sample set, this is New York Gospel, we found mainly female animals making up the text, although we didn't analyze very many. More recently, we've been looking at a range of Spanish documents. We've been link, trying to link um, uh, the rise of the wool production in medieval Spain to the importance of the merino sheep. And we are aware of the way those sheep were managed and the fact that castrated males tended to produce the most wool and were very uh, popular. And so imagine all the sheep's going to be made of uh, male uh, skins. It turns out the vast majority and a much larger num number here are female. So um, maybe it indicates that actually the skins used for parchment were not the skins used for wool products. We don't know. Um, but that requires DNA, not proteins. In terms of age, we can say some things. Um, we're trying actually to get a better measurement of the real age, although we are, we can certainly tell when an animal is very young. So all of the calf, we can see uh, a protein called fetal hemoglobin, which is only produced up to the age of six weeks, six to eight weeks. And also by the size of the animals, we know these are killed extraordinarily young. And it's really quite intriguing when you think about it in terms of animal management, but actually young animals are almost never found at this age in the archaeological record. So what's happening to those bones, we don't know. Um, we are trying to find a way of actually aging the oldest animals now. At the moment, that is not yet working. It's an idea in progress. And that's based on protein aging within the skin. And we've got a follow up to that um, saying some people say that they can claim what type of parchment it is by looking at it or handling it. Has your research proven this to be untrue? Yes and no. I mean, um, <laughs> It depends who you, we, we've done some blind tests and we get up to 30% error with people who are experienced and are prepared to do a blind test. Um, but I would say that I think it's relatively easy uh, once you get your eye in to tell calf from sheep goat. It's much harder with sheep goat, particularly because different breeds being used in the past had very different follicle patterns and that's what you're mainly going on. Um, so I think that's the, the larger one. Although there are some beautifully prepared late antique uh, sheep parchment, which look like half skin. Um, but no, by and large, I think um, an experienced uh, person can probably tell. And what, what is also really interesting, uh, you heard about these wonderful spectroscopic techniques um, this morning. Um, and we have found that with fours, um, we can probably tell apart um, sheep from goats, at least in modern samples, and if we could do that because you can tell part calf anyway, maybe with the addition of other spectroscopic techniques, you wouldn't need the protein-based method. But at the moment, there's enough errors, and we, our most experienced people who have been doing this all the time and look at it, they always get it wrong still. So they always end up relying on the protein analysis and not the visual analysis. Okay, and um, one final question that was in um, is from Bob. Is it possible to study tanned skins or skins that have been treated in other ways, like Tord, as well as parchment? Yeah. Yeah, might so, we so, move, so, sorry, might we use this to reappraise our theories on bindings as well? Yeah, well, so the, 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 crazy, the crazy thing with the bindings is that a lot of stuff that we identified originally as, 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 as calf skin binding um, uh, was, in fact, coming out as deer skin. In fact, and, and what we're really intrigued by here is that there are, there are temporal variations so that uh, deer skin is very popular in the Carolin Carolingian world. And then the weird finding is that, that, that we have these um, uh, outer bindings, these, uh, these hairy bindings on a lot of Cistercian documents on obviously important, um, important texts that they have. And they're turning out to be seal skin. And the genetics of those is also, they're not merely their seal skin, but they're also coming from very northern latitudes. Um, and so we think this, these are from colonies which today are found in sort of northern Norway. Um, so we think that these are probably Viking imports into the medieval world. Um, and that seems to be something that is picked up in the early Cistercian tradition, and that seems to be uh, followed through. Um, and so, yeah, so I think we can see those differences. Um, and, and it will be intriguing to see a larger, larger scale pattern of that. Yeah. Thank you. We'll leave questions there. Um, I'd like to thank all of our speakers, so Kate, Eileen and Matthew, for two really interesting presentations. Um, we're now going into a short break until three o'clock, but I'm hoping that you can continue this conversation. Um, the chat will be recorded along with this session. Um, and made available at a later date, but you are invited as well to make use of the community features of our conference platform. So do use that as a networking opportunity during the break. 
and we hope to see you back at three o'clock. Thank you.